Hello, I'm Wayne Brough, HDB Knowledge Exchange Manager, and welcome to this HDB webinar ex uh, examining the selection and use of biological control, control agents in ornamental crop production. In this, the first of two webinars, we focus on uh, sap sucking pests, primarily aphid and whitefly. Before I introduce the two speakers and their presentations, just a few housekeeping points to address. First of all, you'll notice uh, you, the audience is on mute. Uh, but please don't let this stop you from uh, posing questions. I'll, I'll come I'll come on to how to pose a question in a moment uh, on the next slide. In terms of timings, uh, the uh, the webinar itself will last about an hour, give or take five or ten minutes, uh, depending on the number of questions we we get. It will be recorded, and uh, so if you do have to leave or if if you need to pass it on to colleagues, it will be available next week on the HDB website. Uh, there is a handout available which contains all today's slides and I'll come uh, on to that in the next slide as to how to download it. You should have hopefully applied already for your basis in the ROSO forms. If you haven't, uh, again, you can download the forms and send those to Maya to sort of get your points for today's webinar. So just coming back to uh, the, the uh, questions and handouts, you should have something similar to what's on the screen now in terms of a menu in the top right hand side. If you want to sort of downsize the menu so you're just left with the four icons, click the red button with the white arrow. But before you do so, uh, please uh, go down and click on the, uh, the gray bar which says handouts. Hit the, um, the white downward facing arrow so you can then pick from the drop down menu uh, the handout uh, so you can download the handout. Please try and do that uh, throughout uh, the, the, uh, today's presentation. And if you do need the basis in the ROSO forms, uh, they're, they're there as well. So if you haven't applied for, for points, you can download those and send those to Maya. And again, questions, hit the, hit the questions bar, uh, drop down box will appear, type in the question and then send it to me. I'll keep an eye on the questions and then I'll pose them uh, to both uh, uh, presenters at the end. We're going straight from uh, uh, Neil to David and we'll take questions at the end. As I said before, the, the presentation will be available on the HDB website, hopefully next week. Uh, so in term, terms of today's uh, uh, programme, we've got two speakers. Uh, Neil will be covering the technical detail behind managing aphids and white flies using biocontrol. And David will be providing uh, the, the grower case study uh, based on the approach uh, or adopted by Flory Nurseries. As I say, at the end, we'll be taking questions uh, and answer session uh, taking questions from both speakers. So just quickly to introduce uh, both speakers before we commence. Uh, Neil Hellier is well known to industry, uh, having been the IPM specialist at Fargo since 1995. And before that, he was the research entomologist uh, for 20 years at the Glasshouse Crops Research Institute. Neil, unfortunately, is, is now retired, but uh, we've managed to sort of draw him out of retirement and he's, he's given this and the next webinar. Uh, David is a technical manager at Fleury Nursery, uh, part of the Tristan Plants and Flower Plants Group, uh, which David will expand on during his presentation. And David was uh, the technical manager at Fargrow for seven years uh, prior to this. So uh, if I can now ask David just to close his webcam and mute his microphone, and we'll commence with uh, Neil's presentation uh, as part of the first part of this webinar. Thank you. Okay, hopefully you can start, you can see all of that. Um, okay, this is part one. Uh, the second part is on the 17th of June and will be on strips and spider mites. So the next couple of slides are just sources of information, quite useful to know. The AHDB Crop Walkers Guides, they were the hard copies, they're now available as an app. It's exactly the same, but they are very useful with good color images of various pests, diseases, nutritional, the whole range, very useful. And also identification guides. The AHDB pest bulletin is a regular update on what's going on. A lot of it is on the agricultural side, but when it comes to the aphids, it will mention a lot of the specific or scientific names of the aphids like Mises persicae, and that is one which goes on to a lot of horticultural and ornamental crops. So it is worth looking at that to tell you when the aphids are flying and when aphids are likely to come into your crops. The Bayer Expert Guide is absolutely brilliant. Um, try and get a copy of that. It is downloadable, it's off the internet, it's a freebie. 
but it's got good line drawings of a lot of aphid species and it just helps you identify what you're trying to control and as we go through the proceedings you will start to see how important it is to know what species you're trying to control the belgian one on Topeki, Topeki is the other name for main man again it's a useful guide as to the aphid identifications it also this one covers more of the natural enemies to let you know which parasites and predators you may be finding in amongst your aphid colonies okay now next slide the important ones sticky traps sticky traps only work by the light reflected from them attracting flying insects towards them therefore if you have your sticky trap on a piece of string it's not as efficient as having it in a fixed position and ideally having the exposed side facing south to southwest i say southwest more for the winter months when things are cooler because generally the afternoons are warmer and any flight activity will take place in the afternoons over to those sticky traps there's a whole range of different colors and a whole range of different shapes and sizes so just to let you know that sticky traps are very useful they now most of them come with a peel off back so if you only expose one side you've halved the cost of using sticky traps so they are essential i say essential they are very useful one of the tips i'd like to say is try and keep them at least five meters away from your beneficial release points any closer and you're likely to catch a lot of flying parasitoids onto the sticky traps fargro well before i left fargro before i retired um, we put together a guide as to use of sticky traps in various crops if this one goes through the different colors what you'd use different colors for so there's a red sticky trap mainly for leafhopper and micro moths there's also a very useful guide chart at the back of the, of the printout to give you a, a collection to write down what you're finding. So it's a useful little guide and it's a, again, it's off the internet, so it's a freebie. Okay, management of aphids. So we look at how, where, and when aphids start to migrate in. We look at the biological controls available and we'll finish off with the chemicals. You may come across the term an alate aphid or an apterous aphid. It says it on the slide there. So an alate is the winged form. The middle picture there shows the eggs of certain species of aphids. A lot of aphids have a double barrel name. And frequently that double barrel name, part of it is a soft summer host plant and part of it is the harder woody host plant. So if we take Mises persicae, the common name is the peach potato aphid. So potato being the summer host plant, peach being the hard woody winter host plant. That's the one they lay their eggs into. Eggs initially laid light green to creamy, creamy color to light green, but they harden to this black color. Once they've turned to that black color, you can more or less, you won't kill them basically. That's where the old fashioned tar oil winter washes came in. They would smother and suffocate, but those have gone. So we are now left with a, a hole in the armory as to where we should have winter control for eggs on aphid, uh, aphid eggs on plants. So just going to look at some of the aphid species. So if we look at the peach potato aphid, Mises persicae. Um, about one and a half to two millimeters in length, more of an oval shaped body. And this does come important later on when we start looking at which parasitoids to use. So this is the one that comes in all year round. If you notice on the slide there, it says no sexual phase. So they don't have males and females. They are all females and they're all giving birth to live young. So quite a rapid breeding aphid. This is the larger aphid. This is the um, melon, not sorry, melon cotton. This is the glasshouse potato aphid, a Eulacorthum solani. Easily identifiable because they're always going to be this light green color, but they have that darker green patch around the siphunculi. 
think of the siphon canal as the exhaust pipes. Okay, so that's the two pipes coming out the rear end of the aphid. That's not where the honeydew come from. The honeydew comes from that little flicker in between. So they flick the honeydew away from their bodies. Now, this particular aphid is much larger. We're talking about two to three millimeters in length. In terms of ornamentals, begonia, chrysanthemums, and plants like that are the main host plants, but they have a very, very wide host range of plants. The important thing about this aphid is that its saliva is toxic to the plant and it will cause distortion and yellowing of the leaf. The photograph in the picture there shows a pepper leaf and that was done by literally one or two aphids cause that yellowing on the leaf. So they can do a lot of damage and they can distort and twist and fold the leaf as they feed. Okay, melon cotton aphid, again a double barrel name, melon being the soft summer hose plant, cotton is a harder woodier plant. This aphid can come in a range of different colours, it can be this light green to almost jet black, they have a waxy cuticle so they're not shiny, but they always have those short black siphunculi, the exhaust pipes. This happens to be the fastest breeding aphid that we have in the UK. So it's, it's going to come in, it's going to fly in, and it's going to do a lot of damage very, very rapidly. So again, that's where sticky traps, in my opinion, would come in useful to help identify when the aphids are on the wing and when to start looking at your controls. Black bean aphid, okay, it's got a single barrel name, a single name to it, black bean, but again, a phenomenal range of host plants. This one does have a sexual phase in the autumn and they overwinter predominantly on those plants. So Euonymus, and that would be the uh, Euonymus europaeus, the spindle tree. It's the most common host plant for overwintering of the black bean aphid. We also find on Philadelphus, Viburnum, a whole range of Viburnums. Those are the more common host plants. So if you've got any of those plants near the nursery, just, well, you're going to get that black bean aphid every year. Sorry. OK, start looking at the controls. The parasitoid wasps, and we now have a whole range of different genuses and species of parasitoid wasps available to us. They all work on what I refer to as a one to one ratio. So one wasp will lay one egg into one aphid and the net return is one parasitoid back out. However, a lot of the parasitoids do a thing called host feeding, where they find the aphid, instead of laying an egg in it, they will stab it numerous times. They will insert their ovipositor much further and wiggle it around, and then they will suck the juice from that wound. So they're acting as a predator as well as a parasitoid. So in terms of reproduction, it is a parasitoid, but day-to-day -day feeding, majority of these parasitoids will kill one or two aphids in addition to what they parasitize. So they are useful. Now, in terms of species, we have Aphidius colmani. That's the cheapest to buy, but that is the best parasitoid for the smaller round-bodied aphids. So ones like Aphis cassipii, melon cotton, Mises persicae, peach potato, that's the parasitoid to go for, Fidus colmani. For the larger aphids, so are things like a Eulocorthum, Macrocyphum, the bigger two to three millimeter aphids, we want one called Aphidius irvi. These are available individually or as a mix of the two parasitoids together. We also have Aphelinus, which is a different genus, Aphelinus abdominalis, we have Aphidius matricari, we have Preon volucre, we have Aphidrus species, Aphidrus thrasicola. So there's a whole range of different aphid parasitoids out there, but this mix is important to know which aphids you're trying to control. Okay, just a quick look at how they work. The picture on the top right shows a parasitized aphid with the larva of the parasitoid inside it. 
The next aphid, next picture on the top left, top left, top right, top right shows the parasitized aphid in the mummy stage, but turned upside down to show where the body has been split open to give the parasitoid more space inside the body of the aphid. That's normally fixed to the leaf. When you buy them commercially, that's been taken off the leaf and that's available in the bottles and tubes that you purchase. The picture down below that with the round holes, that's exactly what we're looking for. If you're finding circular holes, it may be the lid has popped, popped, popped back down again. That's where the aphid parasitoid wasp has emerged and done its job. That's brilliant. It, thumbs up. You're now breeding your own aphid parasitoids. However, bottom left is what's known as a hyperparasitoid. This is a parasite of the parasite of the aphid. So this lets the primary parasitoid do the hard work. It kills the aphid. It makes this cocoon. Then the second parasitoid takes over. But to emerge, it cuts a ragged hole towards the head or body or back of the aphid. So you can quite clearly identify when you're breeding your own parasitized and things are working fine, or when things are beginning to go wrong and you're getting the wrong parasitoids coming out. We have honestly seen hyperparasitoids come in, they've taken over, killed the parasitoids, the main primary parasitoid, and your aphid numbers have started to increase. So when you start seeing the hyperparasitoids, it is absolutely important to know what's going on, but it's also pointless introducing more parasitoids. That's the time to go on to predators to control your aphids. OK, this slide shows a whole range of aphids, aphid species down the left hand column. Along the top, we have the different parasitoid species. But you'll notice that some boxes have got three crosses in them, which means brilliant. Those are the rest the right parasitoid to go for that aphid. Others have one, two, and some have a cross, and then some are blank. Now, if you look at Aphis fabi, which is the black bean aphid, you can see how difficult that's going to be con to control with aphid parasitoids. So this is when you want to control with predators much more efficiently. Also draw your attention to one called Mysis asculonicus, which is third up from the bottom. That common name of that is the shallot aphid. This has its natural built-in defense that when a parasitoid goes near it, they can unplug rapidly and they literally drop off the plant to the ground. And then that means that the parasitoids just physically can't get hold of the aphids. So, Again, this is a much more difficult species to control. And Aphidius, where are my notes? Aphidia, are you, ah, there we go. Mises asculonicus is widely found on strawberries as well as a whole range of ornamentals. So it is one that's to be aware of. OK, now moving on to the predators. Notice how that ratio has changed from one larva, orange larva, will need at least five large aphids, so at least five or so a eulicorthum, but up to 30 odd, 35 smaller individual aphids. They're also more fecund. They will lay more eggs than the parasitoids. So these are much better controlling colonies of aphids as opposed to individual aphids. A Fidelites female in the photograph has got short antenna. She lays her eggs nocturnally amongst the aphid colonies. So they locate that by the scent of the honeydew. So the bigger the colony, the more honeydew, the more eggs are being laid amongst that colony. Initially, the eggs are going to be smaller than the leg of the aphid. You won't see them. That larva bites into the body. It injects a toxin which paralyzes the aphid. It's still alive, but it's paralyzed. They then plug in anywhere on the body and suck that aphid dry. As they grow, they go on to the next aphid. And as the bottom picture shows, the larvae will get to about three to four millimeters in length and now much bigger than the aphid. They will then drop to the ground to pupate in the 
compost, in matting, in any detrite, any dust or dirt, they will spin a silken cocoon and pupate in that area. So after two or three weeks, they will re-emerge, but they need that minimum 15 and a half hours of day length to recycle. We reach that critical period after about week 16 to 17 of the year. After that, we're on more than 15 and a half hours, and this predator will recycle every two to three weeks. Once you've got them established, they will come back year after year. And this one feeds on black bean aphids. It's a very useful predator. Photograph here shows the top left-hand picture, shows the empty cocoons in amongst the vermiculite carrier that they are released into. Top right shows the male of Fidelites with those long curved antenna. The two bottom pictures show various release methods. So the byline can come in a, a blister pack or can come in a bottle where you shake them out in tubs. The idea of the three pot system is for ebb and flow benches. So you can put them on a bench but the important part of it is to have that fleece or netting inside the pot. The females hold onto the netting and they mate on that netting. In nature, it's on spider cobwebs. So they use the webbing to hold their bodies where they pump their wings out, get themselves active, and then they can fly off. So nice, easy way to do things. OK, next one up. Now look at that ratio. So we're now at least 250 individual aphids but this is what's known as a generalist predator they will feed on any soft-bodied prey so that's aphids thrips spider mites young caterpillars moth eggs the whole lot they will bite they will bite humans so not going to kill you but they will bite but they're a very useful little predator to put around notice the bottom line in that text introduced to hedges to prevent pest migration. If we know what species of aphids are around, and we know we have the double-barreled aphids, those that overwinter on various host plants outside in hedgerows, if you introduce the lacewings to the hedge as it begins to leaf up in end of late April, early May, depending on what the season throws, then these will actually start to reduce the number of aphids and other pests migrating onto the nursery. So it is a useful technique, it's perfectly legal. These are also cannibalistic. This is why they introduced in this buckwheat husk, this brown, as the bottom picture there shows those brown shells of a buckwheat. They must be in contact with the plant. The larvae have got six legs, they can only walk. So all the companies do these little release boxes. You can hang the release box on the plant, or if you have a decent enough canopy to just sprinkle the buckwheat over the canopy, they will work their way through and start to find the aphids. The adult lacewing gives you no benefit in terms of aphid control, but they will lay eggs. So the adult lacewing is not predatory at all. OK, what nature gives us, we have, sorry about the rattle there, we have anthocorids, top left. I hope you'll recognise what the middle picture is. There's a ladybird adult and a ladybird larva. And that ladybird larva is feeding on an alate aphid. The bottom row on the bottom left is an adult hoverfly. And the larva in the bottom right is the hoverfly larva. So we're talking in the bottom picture there of anything over a thousand aphids per larva. A similar number for the ladybird, both the adult and the larva are predatory. So ladybirds are brilliant. They will actually eat any species of aphid. I don't, I've never come across one that they won't actually feed on. Some ladybirds are more specific on what they like to feed on, but the general two spot, seven spot, 14 and 21 spot ladybird are all very useful generalist aphid predators. We're often asked about ants. Ants are in fact a foe. Ants will protect aphids, they will drive the ladybird away. In that photograph the ladybird is not going to hang around with the ant, the ladybird will win. Sorry, the 
the ant will win. So if you have aphid problems, you must find an ant nest if you've got them and find out where it is and control it. There's various proprietary products. I'm not pushing any particular one, but the majority of them now used spinosad as the active ingredient. Spinosad is the active ingredient in conserve. So conserve will control ants, even though it's not on the label. Okay, so that's an initial look at parasitoids, predators, and now we look at the pathogens. Notice how that ratio is. So one fungal spore can literally infect an aphid and come back with over a million, if not more than, from a single aphid. Once this gets going in an aphid colony, it forms what's called an epizootic infection, zoo as in animals, and it goes through the entire animal population, aphid population, not other animals. So useful products, the Pandora is a naturally occurring fungus, and that makes the aphid bodies turn this rusty brown color. Now these are naturally occurring, you can't buy them, but in the autumn, if you get the conditions right, they will rip through entire aphid colonies. So it's extremely efficient at controlling aphids. Going back to the Bovaria, that's available as Botanigard and Naturalis L. Generally, you can tank mix it with insecticides and nematodes. So nematodes to control thrips, to control vine weevil, to control other pests. When it comes to fungal applications, just check on the websites on the compatibility, ask the manufacturer, the supplier, to check whether that fungicide is safe with this fungal pathogen. So it's quite important. The other thing on Bovaria is that it requires a humidity. It requires a reasonable temperature. So we're looking at 20 odd centigrade. Anything 18 upwards is fine anything below 10 is just switched off. So you're looking at reasonable temperatures, reasonable humidity, and then that Botanigard Naturalis will take over and do a brilliant job in knocking out your aphids. Okay, finishing off on aphid pesticides, you'll notice I put a couple in red, not to say that you can't use them, but these are the ones which will destroy your biocontrols. So things like Batavia, Botanigard, Gazelle, Mainman, Invigorator, Sequoia, Spruzit, Tech Bomb, very useful. They, they integrate with the biologicals. The one I will mention again is Tech Bomb. At the moment, it does not have an ornamentals approval. It has protected edible crops on label and they are waiting for the approval to say we can get it onto protected ornamental crops. Currently, we don't have that approval. OK, that was aphids. Um, hopefully, if you've got any questions, Wayne will take those now and I can start putting the answers to them later on. Right. White fly control, we do very similar to the aphids. Look at where they come from, the biocontrols and the pesticides. White fly, we have to contend with different species, different genuses of white fly are coming into ornamental crops. The glasshouse white fly, Trilirodes, is the more common species. Photograph there shows a male and a female. In fact, if we're doing it right, it's the female on the left, male on the right, male smaller than the female. The middle picture shows a Bermisia, female. The right hand picture again shows a male and female of Bermisia, which is the tobacco white fly. They're both white. From a view above, you can see that the Bermisia is more of a hunchbacked white fly, and you can see the body between the wings. The wings are much more adjacent to the body, much tighter to the body, as opposed to glass cells, which are flatter over the body. That's fine if you know what you're looking for, you've seen it before. If you've not come across them, if you can find the pupil stages of the white fly, it makes it much easier to identify the species. You see my identification of a pork pie or a Cornish pasty. If you look at the images above the Cornish pasty and the pork pie, you can see what I'm trying to get to. 
the port pie picture is an adult, sorry, a mature pupa of the glasshouse whitefly. The middle picture is one I took myself. It just shows where the pupa or the adult has emerged from that pupil case. But looking at the straight sides on that pupil case, the bermisia is the more dome shaped body. Again, that's an empty pupa where the adult whitefly has emerged. So it does not have straight sides. It is completely flat over the body. Again, very similar to Cornish pasty. The other one that we're finding now is the honeysuckle whitefly. This is a different genus again. So we've had Trilorodes, Bermisia, now Allerodes, so different genuses. The photograph shows Bermisia tabaki in the larval and pupal stage versus the honeysuckle whitefly in the pupal stage. And again, we have the adult Allerodes on the right hand side. The wings on this honeysuckle whitefly are held more like the glasshouse whitefly, but they have that little V shaped mark on the wings, and that identifies it as an Allerodes species. The photograph of the honeysuckle whitefly, both leaves are strawberries. So forget the name honeysuckle, we found it infecting Alstromera. That was the first place we came across. This honeysuckle whitefly was on a crop of Alstromera. And the biocontrols going in for glasshouse whitefly were not maintaining control of this whitefly species. So this is how we find out what's going on. The whitefly weren't being controlled. We identify the problem and then we come up with this hopefully a solution. Honeysuckle whitefly is found on herbs. It's found on a whole range of ornamental crops as well. So it does have a very wide host range and it is becoming more of a nuisance. I have honestly known the pupil stage to be taken away by plant inspectors, plant health inspectors, who came on site, put a notice on, statutory notice, do not move these plants, get the species identified, thinking it was Bermisia because they look very similar. Reality was it was the honeysuckle whitefly. Notice was lifted a few days later, carry on marketing the plants. So just to be aware that this one is a nuisance. And because it's an Allerodes, I just want to look at the glass, the cabbage whitefly. This one, again, flat wings, but four Vs on the wings. So you can see multiple marks on the wings. This one also produces much more wax over the leaf. Obviously, the cabbage whitefly is going to go on brassica crops. Brassica crops would include wallflower, aricimum, and other brassica type plants. So at the moment, it's not spread off of brassicas, but who knows in a few years time, they could start to find a taste for other plants and become more of a nuisance. OK, looking at the parasitoids, we have Incarsia formosa, been around since the 1920s, very useful on the glasshouse whitefly, but not so good on some of the other species. Arachmacerus is a better parasitoid in terms of other aphid species, more expensive, works at a higher temperature, but also lives at lower temperatures as well, so it would take the tolerance of different high, high and low temperatures, available singly or as a species, as a mix of Bincasia and Arachmacerus. Arachmacerus also does more host feeding, which is why they're more expensive. They're actually more expensive to produce, so the producer has to spend more money to get the parasitoids in the bottles to actually sell to you. So it is a better parasitoid all round. Now we're looking at the predators. So we have predatory mites, Amblyseus montarensis, Swirsky, Degenerans, a whole range of different aphid uh, predatory mites. These generally feed on the egg stage of the whitefly, although Montarensis and Swirsky will feed on the younger first instar larva. So they are useful predators, um, but again, introduction, they must be in contact with the plant. There's no point putting it in a sachet above the crop. It's got to be on the plant itself to get the mites out to do the job. Macrolophus. One of my favorite predators, this one will take all species of aphids, sorry, all it whitefly, will also feed on leaf miner, will feed on spider mites, 
has a good go at thrips. We're finding on mealybug. We're finding on a whole range of other pests as well. So it's a very useful predator to introduce. Notice the bottom line in that text says about introduction to banker or trap plants such as aubergine, calendula or salvia. This particular bug, and it's a true bug, it's got a stabbing proboscis, lays its egg into the plant tissue. Now on some plants, we've had damage on gerbera, where on the flower stem, you get a little blister that, to be honest, I've seen it, I would hardly notice it at all. You can just about feel this little blister on the plant, but they can, over high numbers, cause a blindness to the plant. That only happens very, very rarely. What we are doing now is introducing banker plants, as like this picture shows as aubergine, scattered through the crops. And we have about one plant to 200 square meters or about 50 aubergines to the hectare. That seems to be a reasonable number to attract the white flight of the aubergine. But notice we're also introducing the parasitoids and predators to the aubergine. Macrolophus is important as well. If you're going to do this, you grow your aubergines. When you get the first of those little purple flowers, that's when you introduce your macrolophus. Point is putting it in beforehand. Grow the aubergines together en masse. When they're ready, introduce the macrolophus, leave them a couple of weeks, and then space them out amongst your crop. You won't regret it. It, it works a treat. OK, looking at the pathogens. So we have a different one now. We have Bavaria bassiana and Lacanocilium. Lacanocilium is the new name for Verticillium lacani, trade name Mycotal from Coppert. Very useful fungal pathogen, but again, it requires the right humidity. So if we can't get the right humidities, that fungus is not going to work. So again, you must make sure you get the right conditions on the leaf surface. We're looking at 95% humidity at the leaf surface. That's quite high. If you can get it, brilliant, it will go through an entire population. Finally, we look at the pesticides. And again, appreciate we're running on time. Just draw attention to a couple of them. Applaud. Different code number. Look at those IRAC code numbers. It's important to pick chemicals with different IRAC mode of action code numbers. But applaud has this reaction called sublimation. That means that if you've sprayed a plant, a day or so later, you will get a vapor form, and that vapor form can remove or move elsewhere and reform elsewhere on another plant. So it drifts through the entire canopy. Very, very useful for plants where you can't get good spray coverage. If you can get it into the base of a plant, it will drift its way through the top canopy to actually kill the white fly. Batavia was called Mavento. I would urge you, if you're going to use it, check on the CRD website because there are a lot of restrictions and suggestions as to which plants you should not use this chemical on. Um, so again, final one down the bottom there, Tech Bomb. We're talking about ornamentals today. At the moment, Tech Bomb does not have an approval for ornamental crops. It will come, but it hasn't got it at the moment. Sequoia, a very useful IRAC 4C, whereas Gazelle is a 4A, they are not the same chemical. The 4A is a neonicotinoid. 4C works a similar situ a situation on the nicotinic acid of the body of the insect, but it is not a neonicotinoid insecticide. Completely different. OK, that was my presentation. I think we're back to Wayne now. Thank you, Neil. Uh, please, if, if you do have questions, if you can submit them and we'll take them uh, after David's presentation. But following nicely on from uh, Neil, uh, giving a case study example and, and the work on going at Flory Nurseries is David Hyde. So over to David now for the approach uh, taken with, with aphid and white fly control at Flory Nursery. Thank you, David.
Hi there, it's David Hyde here. Uh, thanks, Neil and, and Wayne. Um, and Neil, you'll be very pleased to know we do have our aubergines. They're not quite out yet. We are planning on putting them in the crop next week. Uh, so I hope you're pleased with that. Uh, yeah, I was introduced earlier. We are tight for time. Uh, and so I'm not going to repeat my first slide other than say I, I work at Flurry Nurseries. And uh, one of the key things about our um, integrated pest management program is that we work off five sites, five relatively large sites, and each site has its own IPM program. Now, what I'm gonna do is the concept is I'm gonna dovetail in with what Neil has done. Neil has talked about the products, whether or not that's the, the pesticides, the insecticides, the, um, the parasites and the predators. I'm just going to give you a, a background to our approach to integrated pest management focusing on aphid and whitefly, but in many respects, what I'm saying is relevant to IPM per se, and not just the control of aphid and whitefly. Um, so our approach um, is, first of all, we, we, we there's a lot of truisms here, but um, I'm saying we need to know what we're growing, um, where it's going and when, and, plan in advance. Very, very easy to say, uh, sometimes more tricky to deliver, but um, we do have a, a very comprehensive uh, production system. We have space planning tools. So we have a very good idea of when crops are moving in and out of our glasshouse structures, our polythene tunnels, etc. So it is massively important for the effectiveness of what you're doing um, and delivering is to be organized and to plan in advance. One of the other things is uh, when, when I was when I was working for Fargro, we always used to think about the application rate per square meter amount per hectare. Well, I, I would say what I do is look at what we do is look at highlighting critical crops and loading up the amount of bio appropriate to control the pest within that crop. Um, and here we've got a pepper crop, which we did just that last year, uh, and it worked very effectively. So, um, and, a, and a, a mantra I have with all of this is the importance of remaining flexible uh, and be prepared to change. So, so you'll keep on hearing me say that. Um, so our approach absolutely is to involve our suppliers of biological controls. There are a number out there. Uh, we, we partner up with BioBest through BHGS and uh, through Fargro, we use BioLine products. And I think it's really important to get a really good relationship with your suppliers, um, to learn as much as possible from them. But I also add in here not to be ruled by them because I, you know, I've worked for very many years, I think it was 26 years I've worked in one guise or another with Neil. And um, to begin with, all I ever did was listen to what he said and did what he said. And I think he rather liked that. Uh, but I think over the years, you become more confident, you uh, learn about your own particular environment. So I, I think the best way to deliver IPM is to ensure that you have a level of knowledge and expertise yourself Yes, work closely with your supplier, but not be ruled by them. Uh, one of the things that I'm really keen on is involving the team who are responsible for delivering crop protection. Uh, myself and Claire Moran are in the technical team. We are the, effectively the advisors, the agronomists to Flurry Nurseries. We don't actually do the crop protection. So how, how can you deliver effectively on an IPM program unless you engage with those people delivering it on the ground. Uh, and I think that's a massively important point. Um, and here we have one of, one of our crop protection specialists, cultural uh, member of staff, predominantly at our Eastergate site, Mark Shillingford, who um, is responsible for putting out the biological control and who last year worked with us um, when we trialed hoverflies for the first time. And I think there's a really good thing to do because people get excited by hoverflies because you actually see them. Uh, you see them buzzing around in your crop. So it is really uh, absolutely something that motivates people and, and they feel that 
you're actually having a positive impact on your crop. So yes, involving your team is massively important uh, and being able to adapt to particular situations, as I keep saying. Um, Neil mentioned sticky traps and monitoring. Yes, we monitor, we monitor all of the time. No, we don't use sticky traps. I think working across five sites, using sticky traps to monitor effectively will take an inordinate amount of time. And also our crops are moving in and out of our glass houses all of the time. And so I don't personally see it as a viable option. I do though think, um, as Neil intimated, they are excellent for mass trapping. They are a tool for IPM. They are a control method. Whether or not you've got an outbreak of thrip, scarred fly, um, leaf hopper, which um, you know, on Vogue now is to use red sticky traps for that. So yeah, I'm absolutely signed up to that. But to use them for monitoring purposes, no, I, I, I don't think it's worthwhile. Um, who does our who does our crop walking? Who does our monitoring? Well, the answer is all of us. Uh, Claire and I walk our crops every week. Um, here is a picture of of Tim Crittenden from Biobest. He visits monthly along with Simon Bell from BHGS, the new technical manager there. Um, we have Stuart and Alex from Fargo coming in once a month as well. Um, the cultural team who are responsible for the watering are always checking the crops. And then uh, most especially, and slightly disappointingly, but nevertheless very importantly, um, our dispatch teams are always monitoring. And, and from time to time, yes, they do find uh, pests. Um, and very often in that situation, we revert back to, um, if they're going out the door that day or the following day, we revert back to our old favorite SP plant invigorator. Um, but as a practice crop walker, you begin to see pests very early. And that's the most important thing, to try and stop uh, the rise of, of uh, the increase of, of your pest populations. And that's something that Neil would find very easy when he walked our crops. He would find things that we would never see ourselves and he'd see them very easily. So it's definitely, once you've got that, that eye for it, 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 it really works and, and then allows you to adapt your programs accordingly. Um, so how do, how do we approach uh, integrated pest management? Well, we have a fresh start every year. Also, we have fresh starts throughout the year based on the nature of our crops. Some of our crops are only in the glass houses for two weeks, four weeks, six weeks, three months a whole year in, on occasions, but it allows us to always have always have clean starts, uh, which I think is you know, absolutely crucial to keep your populations low in the first instance. Um, there was, a, a, again, another discussion point. This was something I, we would discuss at length, uh, Neil and myself. Is there such a thing as a good cleanup spray? Well, I'm, I'm no, not a fan of them, to be honest. I'm, I'm a fan of applying pesticides when I need to, um, historically, I may have done that uh, when I first met Neil at the RHS and we would do uh, products like Dynamec and Desis, Calypso and Dynamec, Chess and Dynamec at either ends of the season. Uh, but where, where, where I am now, what we do is effectively we have no crop. It's gone. It's either dispatched or as last year on occasions, it was composted. So we have clean starts all of the time. And I think it's really important and there is no need in most instances to do any cleanup sprays. Um, so as far as introducing aphid and white fly controls, we, we have, uh, last year we trialled uh, hoverflies for the first time. Uh, thanks very much to Tim Crittenden from BHGS who, um, and from Biobest who worked with us on that project. Uh, we had no pest problems whatsoever in, in the pepper crop that season. Whether or not it was to do with um, the introduction of the hoverflies, it's always difficult to tell, but uh, it, it, we are continuing to use them this year, so we think there is value in that. We use Aphidius colmani, 
Uh, we load in early season, but it does depend on the weather. This year, not so early. Um, yeah, I would have historically created a program for a grower. We'd say it started in week 10, week 12, week 14, whatever, and we'd start piling in the buyers. Uh, I don't think there is any need for that. I think you should put them in at the point where you feel the pest populations will begin to increase. And this year, as we know, that was very late. Um, and so, but we would use Aphidius colmani, Aphidius irvi, Aphidolites, excuse me, Aphidolites, uh, the hoverfly system uh, from control of aphid, and for whitefly, we almost exclusively only use uh, Incarsia, Incarsia formosa. Um, but as I say, my mantra, remaining flexible, so I wouldn't put them in, I'm not a fan. I won't put them in if you've got no pests. Neil might diff differ on that. He talks about getting that background levels of population up. But again, that's not a necessity for us with the crops that we grow. Um, do we have consideration of economic thresholds for pest levels? Yes, we do. And that changes throughout the, the, the growth of the crop, the development of the crop. In the early stages, we can uh, afford a little bit more pests and indeed having pests is a positive thing for your biological control at the end of the crop as we dispatch it we have zero tolerance to pests so we would apply products to clean up the crop uh, not clean up sprays per se but just for the, the specific crop or the specific, uh, specific uh, batch of crops um, so do we do we have a uh, do we apply pesticides in an I, IPM compatible manner? Yes, we do. Neil mentioned many of the products that we we would use. Yes, we still use SP Plant Invigorator. Uh, we use Flipper. We would we would still use on occasions Gazelle, Majestic. We are going to use the product um, Protac. Yeah, I've, I've read about it. It looks quite an interesting. Uh, physical acting product. Uh, so yes, we would incorporate that into into our thinking. And yes, again, Neil mentioned it, and I'd say yes, we do. Uh, do is it okay to apply non-compatible products? So for aphid, uh, uh, lupin aphid, going out the door. Prior to that, we would apply uh, delta methrin. So absolutely, there are moments when we would. Uh, sacrifice our biological control but more more often than not we're moving the product out so it's not having an, an impact on on the products that remain or the or the biological control that remains in the glass house um, and I was asked to do a whistle stop tour it's always very difficult to do to know how long you've been when you're when you're on a roll um, but Neil started off by looking at the help that you can get out there, the, the books, the information. And I have found, I never used to think this, but I've over the last couple of years, I've, I've sort of become more interested in LinkedIn. And the information on there, the snippets of information, the videos that are posted, uh, the groups that you can join uh, about biological control, I really do think it is worthwhile um, uh, doing because it's very bite-sized, it's very, uh, sort of immediate information which takes you uh, deeper in, into the subject. So I would always recommend that as a very useful source of information. So that's me done, folks. Thank you very much. Thank you, David. If I can ask Neil just to sort of join, come back in with his uh, uh, microphone and, and webcam. Great. I've got four or five questions here. We, we've got about five minutes. So uh, I will pose them. I, I think if you can both chip in, because I, I think you, you you can both add value to, to the majority of these questions I've got. Um, and David mentioned the lupin aphid a little while ago. So perhaps if I can start with, with Neil, when, when you're talking about such a large aphid like the lupin aphid, what, what would you sort of recommend for the control of that particular aphid? Because that's almost like the size of a horse. <laughs> Run. <laughs> that, that's that is like David said. That is a chemical one. Um, there's the willow aphid, which is an enormous, great black aphid with a little spike on its back. Again, if it's that sort of aphid, it's making a lot of honeydew, and the lupin aphid is that grey, waxy 
a cuticle on it, just go straight for chemical. And that would be a combination, whether it be sequoia, delta methrin, um, hallmark, lambda, lambda sihalothrin, something with good residual activity into the heart of the plant. So those are the chemicals you go for, for sure. And that will be your approach as well, David? OK, so I was going to add, um, we have had, um, Flurry Nursery grows a lot of lupin, uh, and uh, we have had over a period of time a lot of that aphid. And to be honest, uh, we have tried all sorts of things to control it chemically. And the only thing that we have been very effective on is applying delta methrin. I, 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 I suspect a hallmark will be equally effective, but I think it does need to be something uh, re relatively um, you know, powerful and unfortunately slightly toxic. OK, thank you for that. Again, this, this is probably best posed to the pair of you. Um, I've seen, I've been, I've been in a few nursery stock crops recently, and I'm just starting to see aphids coming in the growing points. There was a bit of aphid cassipia anonymous recently. What, what do you feel is the best course of action when you do see those aphids stock coming in onto the growing points of crops, Neil? But, but as a general guide, rule of thumb, if you can see the pest on the plant at arm's length or further, then that's where you come in with a spray. So whether it be something like Invigorator or uh, Protac, or what's one of the physical controls, reduce the population, then you can look at biologicals. If you put your biocontrols in too early or too big a population, you're still going to be disappointed with the control because it'll take time to get on top of that population and end up with so many bodies, aphid mummies or whatever on the plants that they're still rejected. So at certain times you come in with a chemical to just keep that balance down. Ideally, you want the whole lot pretty much invisible, but you have to have that pest population there. To let the beneficials do their job. Thanks, Neil. David. And, and your approach, David? Uh, OK, so um, I think remaining flexible. Yes, you might on occasions just pinch the tip out. Uh, I also think um, not I'm taking it off the exact question i think there are always some times when it's just a good idea to throw the plant out or the offending plants out it, you know to take a dramatic approach but one thing we do here um was as i say we we have applied sb plant invigorator at, at that just prior to dispatch and and i i thought there was a certain element of madness to it but then we wash it off with a misting lance and it works very effectively to remove your pest, uh, particularly aphid. So that's something we do uh, if we get caught out. OK, thank you. And we, we have mentioned uh, quite a number of, of the physically acting pesticides, well, products throughout um, the presentation. So what, in your view, determines which one you should use? So we've talked about Flipper, Majestic, Eradicote Max, SB Plant Invigorator. What, what, which one should you go for, Neil, depending on circumstances? What, what's your opinion on this? Whichever one you really want. I mean, they all work very similar to one another. They all smother and suffocate the target. Um, I would say Flipper is useful. Um, it comes in a 10 litre container. You've got a lot of the product around. It has a fairly high rate of use, so 15 mil per litre, up to 15 mil per litre but it works much better in soft water. If you put it with hard water and it goes cloudy, you're losing a lot of activity, a lot of potential activity against your pest. There is a product available from Bayer to add to it to make it work in hard water, um, but it's another chemical, another Adam element to add into the situation. Invigorator is pretty broad spectrum. It takes most things out. Um, it's fairly easy on a whole range of water qualities. Then you've got things like Majestic, um, Eradicote. Again, very useful, but physical contact. You've got to hit the target to get the result. So it all boils down to how good your spraying application is going to be. OK. And, and, and David, any, any preferences here on this one? Sorry. OK, yeah. Um, I think I've always found SB Plant Invigorator does a very good job on spider mite. Uh, following, again, guidance from Neil, day one, day three, day five, and that really does clear up your spider mite. Um, I do like Flipper, 
uh, it seems to work. It seems to work quite well on, on spider mite as well. Uh, Majestic, I've always found quite good on knocking out adult whitefly. Um, and again, Naturalis or Botanigard, I, I don't, I know I've just moved off um, the you know, precisely physical acting, but I am always loath to use it because I want something to be effective and I'm, and, I, and I'm worrying all the time about the humidity levels, have we got it right? So I, I, I think there is a risk, unless you have got that, those humidity levels, unless you are got the, the temperatures right in your glass house, um, you, you may be disappointed. So as much as I want uh, uh, Naturalis to work, um, I'm always slightly uh, sort of sceptical as, and I don't reach for it first. Okay, thank you. And, and a slightly add-on left field uh, to that, have, have you ever looked at uh, silicon for, for pest control? Okay, so um, it, it's it's known to be effective. Um, we we wouldn't, as in this environment, recommend its use for obvious reasons, unless it has got a, an approval. And I don't believe there are any. Uh, however, I am under the under you know, under the impression that that is the nature of Protac. And it is perceived to do a very good job at pest control. And we will probably be trying it. OK, thank you. Neil, any, any comments? Again, I always check with the approvals. Make sure you're legal in what you're advising and what you're actually using. Um, from experience, the silica products are very good on spider mites, but also have activity on powdery mildew. Yeah. So, yeah, useful. Um, but let's test them first. OK, thank you. And one final question, because I'm just look, I'm conscious of the time before we wrap up. Um, probably aimed at Neil here. Um, how do you deal with large influxes of, say, the cabbage white, uh, white fly in, into, into crops with an established IPM program? I'm just thinking here, I'm aware of uh, a, a number of, of say, poinsettia growers who, who may have brassica crops around them, and, and, and I've got a mid-season, got an established IPM program up and running, and all of a sudden there's an influx through the vents of cabbage white. What, yeah. what, do, what do you do? We've seen it before, um, white flow numbers, again, with sticky traps, because I like sticky traps, I know David doesn't, but I do like sticky traps. They will tell you what's going on and look at the wings that will tell you exactly what species, genus of white flies coming in. Invariably, the white fly migrating in may land on your poinsettias, may land on other crops. They may feed. If it's not the right host plant, they're not used to it, they will disappear after a few days. So the first thing to do is don't panic. Monitor the situation. Again, sticky traps are very useful crop walking, lifting plants, turning over leaves, see what's actually in the crop itself, come back a few days later and assess the situation again then. Don't fly off the handle, don't go straight into it with the big guns. If necessary, that's where your physical control would come in first. After that, you're looking at products which are ideally systemic or translaminar, things like Mainman would be probably the first choice I would go for. And then you've got your things like sequoia, but again, you've got that handling interval on sequoia for ornamental. So there are products out there, but you've got to pick the right time and the right products to use at that time. That's where your trained advisor would come in to give you the hopefully the right advice at the right time. Thank you for that, Neil. Um, as I say, it's five past now. So if uh, I will just wrap up with my uh, final slide and uh, just to sort of thank both Neil and, and, and David for your time today. I think it's been useful uh, presentations there on both biocontrol and pesticide uh, selections for uh, both aphid and, and, and whitefly control. Um, you, as the audience, have got a few more seconds to download any, um, uh, uh, oh, sorry, and any, um, the, the, the handout be, 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 before we wrap up uh, today. Oh, I do apologise here. Um, uh, that's better. 
Uh, any, any further questions? If, if, if you didn't get time to sort of submit them, please send them to me and I will pass them on uh, to David and, and Neil over the next few days, uh, just for clarification. Um, and to, just to sort of say the recording, it will be made available next week on the HDB Horticulture uh, web, web page there. That there's a link there, so keep an eye open for that. But looking forward to the future, uh, there's a second part of this uh, uh, series of, of, of biocontrol uh, webinars, as uh, Neil's already mentioned, will be on thrips and mites. So if you want to pop a note in your diary for the 17th of June, same time, we shall see you all there. And uh, best wishes for the remainder of the season and hope it's all been a success for you all. Thank you for joining us and uh, good evening. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.